Uh, I just want to change it up a little, only only because we have Tim and Mike on the call. So I, I want to know from a tiny little defenseman in NHL's perspective that Mike was, you know, uh, from Tim, you know, what are some of the things that you saw with Mike? And because we've had these conversations offline and I, I, you know, I love getting into my, my favorite time is calling Weaver on the way home from my practice with my 14 year old, just to have him hear Mike talk and, and, and just describe kind of the little nuances of what he did as a defenseman um, to kind of counteract the other team. And I think it's, uh, you know, Wally was alluding to it a little bit earlier with Daryl's study and the stuff he's done with video about, you know, uh, not reacting and going where you're supposed to go, but actually, you know, uh, put yourself in an advantageous situation. So I thought, Tim, maybe you could describe a little bit about what you saw as a coach in Mike, and then Mike can hopefully uh, just talk back to just, you know, why he decided or what forced him to go the route he did as far as his own development and the, the way he played the game. That, that's a thank, – thank you for that, uh, Mike. And it's a great question. And very quickly, four things come to mind uh, for me about what I felt made Mike a really, really effective player. And I, I will say, and not just because Mike's on, but I will say I had – plenty of scraps with the management in Atlanta uh, defending Mike, you know, because at the time it was still, NHL was still pretty much a big man's game. And, you know, uh, some of the people in management really felt like, you know, how, how can we be using this five foot nine defenseman? Uh, but for me, he was clearly uh, for long, long stretches and maybe for the whole time he was in Atlanta, he was, he was our best defenseman in my mind. So like four things really quickly come to mind uh, for me with respect to Mike, and I'm not sure what order you might put them in, but uh, one was awareness. He had great uh, hockey sense and just, just was always taking in information, was aware where people were on the ice, which obviously really enhanced his de defensive game and obviously his offensive contribution. But he, he was an intelligent player, uh, always aware of what was going on around him. Uh, uh, number two, he was as good as anyone I, I think I've coached or seen play at making a first pass. He, he rarely, and I mean really rarely, uh, gave up the puck to the other team, um, consistently finding somebody to give the puck to to help the, keep, the play keep going for us. So his first pass was exceptional, uh, consistently exceptional and effective. Um, being a small guy, uh, his body positioning was also exceptional. Uh, you know, he was strong in his skates for a little guy, um, but he was always very conscious of, of keeping his body in a good uh, defensive positions so that allowed him to to be effective defensively and you know I, I might interject Cliff Ronning back in the day was also really good that way even as he was a great offensive player he understood that hey I'm, I'm not as big as some of these guys I'm not as strong as some of these guys M my body positioning awareness is critical to my survival Mike, Mike had that uh, so he, you know, he was really aware of what was going on around the ice. He always, and partly because of that, he, he consistently made a good first pass. Uh, his body position was always very good. And, and lastly, he competed like hell, um, even though he was a smaller guy. And those four qualities, to me, um, obviously are, are great and applicable to all players, but really really important uh to be a good defenseman um so and really you know what there's another guy we had in atlanta and i don't remember weave if you crossed with him or not uh but brian pothy or potsy who's uh sometimes mm -hmm. sometimes coach with the national uh the u.s national women's girls um potsy was another guy i had a lot of battles with with the atlanta management you know he was, for me, a very similar type of player. Great first passer, uh, great awareness, 
uh, really uh, good body position guy. And I loved him as a player. And, you know, we, he, you know, the, his rookie year, he was our best defenseman through training camp and early into the season. And, um, you know, all I kept hearing was, Hey, you're playing him too much. You're playing him too much. And I'm like, he's our best defenseman. You want me to sit our best defenseman on the, on the bench? Is that what you really want? So anyway, I had some of those uh, battles um, with the management there. Don's of course done very well for himself and is a really good hockey man, but he and I didn't see eye to eye on, on either you or, or Potsy <laughs> to a large degree. But anyway, you were a treat to coach, Mike, and uh, I really mean that. And you were a terrific player. It doesn't surprise me. You played as long as you did and, and as effectively as you did. Well, I'm blushing right now. Um, I, I'm going to say, though, the, the one thing, um, um, obviously, with every, with every coach, you got to have good assistants. And the good assistants basically um, kind of almost interact with the players um, uh, more and, and almost re-explain kind of what the coaches uh, uh, was saying. So it's, it's something that, um, yeah, with every, with every coach, you, you need some very a good su- support staff. So obviously, uh, Tim, you, you were just uh, just amazing, um, obviously, um, answering the questions because I was always a, a person that didn't want to just uh, be told what to do, but wanted to understand um, uh, why I was doing that. And I think that why um, a lot of people are nervous to ask why. And I think that's something that I was very good at and, and just wanted to know exactly the the ins and outs of the, the purpose for everything. Um, I'm going to say one of the really cool things that when we're there for our first year, I signed with Atlanta Thrashers a, uh, after Michigan State. And I ended up, we ended up going to the, we ended up going to the, the uh, training camp. Um, it was very interesting training camp. Um, I remember I, I got my first uh, taste of being a rookie. I, 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 after, after one of the, after one of the practices, I came in, I, I grabbed my phone and, and I, uh, I ended up redialing and back then you had the flip phones, right? The like, oh my God, that didn't really work half the time, but I ended up just pressing a, a number that I just, I, I redialed the, the, the same number. And obviously even back then, I don't think you really knew the phone numbers, um, um, and I just pr- pressed the person's name to call him back. And all of a sudden they're like, uh, this is uh, Don Waddell, uh, GM of Atlanta Thrashers. Please leave a message. I'm like, oh my God. So somebody went into my phone and ended up changing a phone number that I just called to Don Waddell's phone number. So yeah, that was, uh, that was very, ner- I would have been very nervous if all of a sudden he picked up the phone. And, um, but I, I'm going to say one of the amazing things, though, right after training camp, I had a great training camp. He ended up coming in and saying, he's just like, guys, you guys are all going, all the rookies are going down to Orlando and you're going to learn how to be a professional from the older players. And I thought that was a really, really cool thing to do because I was always, you know, I, I always took that, like you have your bad coaches and you have your good coaches and then you have your bad players and good players, but you always, one thing a, a lot of players don't go and look around and, and being able to, uh, take a little bit of everything from, uh, from everything. And, and that's kind of what I did. I went down there and, um, uh, Todd Richards was, uh, down there and I, a couple of the bad things that he, uh, that he did, I didn't take notes of that. He would always show up with a six pack of Mountain Dew for, uh, beginning of the game. And he would be in there drinking his Mountain Dew and, and, uh, not even warming up. He, the guy was a legend. He would just get on the ice and he was, Oh, like he was just amazing. He never made mistakes. That guy was just awesome. But that's something that um, I didn't obviously take a couple of those uh, bad habits, but I ended up going and, and kind of looking around to the other players. We had such an amazing team uh, um, uh, down there. We had, we had some, we had some great players, great memories down there. Um, um, and yeah, it, it that gave me a very good year to get underneath my belt. And then when I went up to, uh, uh, to Atlanta, I remember uh, Andy Sutton, who's like six foot nine, basically, and me, the little midget out there. 
um, like it was it, like him and I just got along so well and it was just, it was just easy. And we were like, I was like second player or third player of the game during that 40 game one, one year I had 40 games and to get my bonus would have been 41 games that I got set down with, uh, when, um, um, uh, coach came in, um, uh, Bob, oh my God. what was it? Hartley after yeah, Hartley came in. Yes. Oh my God. Just, yeah. I try and forget that name. Um, uh, but he ended up, he ended up coming in and he, you know, he, uh, the next draft, he set me down within three, three games and he brought up, um, a uh, pretty big defenseman, but basically he, in the train, in, in, um, uh, at the, at the draft, he ended up bragging that he just drafted, you know, 20 feet or 30 feet of defenseman. So, you know, back then was, was obviously was very unique. And, and I think, I think I thought the game a little bit different than anybody else, the way that I did it. A lot of people go and watch the puck. I would, I would always watch what the other four players are doing because, and Sammy, don't you be, you don't be saying this on the air here. If you're saying it on the air, make sure that you're saying, "Oh, Mike Weaver." <laughs> um, but, but I would always, if I was able to understand what the other four players' options were, not just where they were, options, I was able basically to tell the future. And I think that's one thing that I was very, very good at is being able to tell the future. And it's kind of almost, I would never compare myself to Wayne Gretzky, but it, he would always be like, you know, go to, he never was uh, going to where the puck was, but where the puck was going to be. And, and I, that's kind of what I did. I, I, I would always, I would always position myself in front of the net because it's very tough to move a six foot uh, a guy uh, from the front of the net when you're five, nine. Um, so if I was able to position myself, um, that I'm able to engage with them when they're not even moving, because if I was to get engaged with these tall guys, when I was moving, I would get friggin' just, just blown apart. So if I was able to stop them and be proactive and that that's kind of was my game was being proactive, being able to, um, like, like what I, I, I stopped Ovechkin. Like literally there was a couple times that Ovechkin moved to the offside. He went to the offside and after the game, he said it was me. And I'm like, that's kind of crazy. Ovechkin, like one of the top guys, what was I doing? I wasn't doing anything different. I wasn't magically going, I wasn't fast. Like sure I had a long stick and it got, um, it, it put on an inch every year I, I got older. Um, but I'm going to say that one of the big things is what did Ovechkin do? I, I looked at tendencies. He would go and curl deep in a zone and he would flank out to the boards and, and he would get a cross ice pass going hundred miles an hour. So what do I do? Well, I like to, I, I call, I call the gap. I don't call it gap. I don't really like the name because it's just, it's somebody's ice. It's either yours or his. So if I was, able to go in and, and get my ice um, and I was able to go up and be kind of some within within distance like I don't want to be on them because if they don't pass it to him they pass it to somebody else because you're influencing it so if I'm able to be in the vicinity of that it's gonna they might try and pass it to them and I would have it or they won't pass it to them and that's probably the the objective that you want you don't want it in his hands so I just basically figured out the game. The Sedin twins, they do the same routes every single time. I, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. Like I'm like, it, everybody's just like, oh, they're difficult to, to handle. I'm like, no, they take the same routes. So it's 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 all about, I think, looking at, uh, especially in, in playoffs, what, do, what, do the coach, uh, what does the coach do? He looks at tendencies. They do a whole entire watch all these videos and they walk, look at tendencies. So that's kind of what my game was as a whole was basically – being one step ahead of the next player and, and coming up with different techniques that I was able to uh, apply. I think Tim, you, you were, you were first there. Yeah. I, I'm not sure as, if it was me or Tom, but I'll, I'll just quickly Tom interject uh, like, like two things. I wanted to go back 
uh, and sort of add, you know, I mentioned that Mike was a great first passer and so was uh, Brian Pothier. Uh, and I've said this before, like I wish I could, I could find the video of Bobby Orr uh, talking about what the most important attributes of a defenseman are because that was his number one thing. As great as he was at uh, initiating offense and joining the, <clears throat> joining the rush, leading the rush, he always felt his number one job was to find a forward to give the puck to, to help initiate the exits, the offense, uh, whatever. And Mike was real good at that. That's number one. And I, and number two, really quickly, I, lo I loved your comment, Mike, about uh, when you said, I, I wouldn't watch the puck, I'd watch the other four players and I would be proactive. Because for me, that, that ties into what we were talking about before with the small area games. And again, I'm on my soapbox because I've said this many times. If there are young coaches out there that don't know what to do with their teams at practice, even if they're, you know, eight years old or 10 or 11 years old, play some games and encourage them to do exactly what Mike did and what that what Tom touched on really with the four uh, finish hockey rules. You either have the puck or supporting the puck, both offensively and defensively. So if you play small area games with your team and all you're saying to your players is, hey, try to figure out where the puck is going next. Whether you're on offense, where can it go next and you be, be one of those options or whether you're defending and if you're supporting in a supporting role, figure out where it can go next and take away one of those options. If you can just be in your players' ears about that all the time, they'll develop hockey sense like Mike had and uh, they'll be better players for it. So go ahead, Tom, if you uh, had something to interject. That, that's yep. by far the most difficult difficult thing to uh, teach is is game sense. Like that, you know that that's what I'm really finding hard right now is for for players to look at the situation, read the situation, because I think our system develops one on five players, so they basically go as far as they can without even really knowing who's with them. And then when they run out of options, they're all shut down. Then they look, but it's way too late then. Make that uh, working with each other a big part of the game because it's really a weak part of the game as far as what I've seen players coming up. Uh, Al Ramsey, uh, you can introduce yourself a little bit, Al. You're working with uh, your U10 team in Massachusetts. And Al, I really believe what Mike and Tim has been talking about, Al is doing with his team, I, Al. I wonder if you can comment about your approach um, in terms of the players figuring things out and thinking for themselves. Uh, because I, I typed in, uh, Mike, you could play the game today if you were younger. Uh, the game is allows for that. They're not looking for the big immobile D who protect the net all the time. So, Al, can you introduce yourself and comment on how what you're doing is going to affect players growing up? And coaches have to keep up with them. Go ahead, Al. Sure. Thanks, Wally. So, uh, Mike, it's really nice to nice to meet you here. Um, my name is Al Ramsey. I'm the, um, so I'm a hockey director at a town hockey association in Massachusetts. I'm originally from PEI, uh, but moved to the States here about a dozen years ago. Hockey director at a town youth hockey association. I also coach a 10U team at uh, a club association. Um, I'm a coach developer for USA Hockey. So I do a little bit of stuff uh, you know, in the, in the Massachusetts district as well here. But uh, it's been a really interesting conversation. So my day job is actually I'm a product owner for uh, for a web development team, you know, working on a fairly large website. So it's pretty. Uh, I like your like your site. We, you know, we we've started using tools like that in our associations. Um, actually, trying to get our club association to get onto that. It's, it's funny. Like 
the way the system is here, it's almost like a two-tiered system, right? You've got town associations that's like the nonprofit, like the regular minor hockey, and then you've got club teams that are kind of like the elite associations. But um, you know, we've we've started tying everybody together at the town hockey association in underneath like an age level director, say at eight U and a ten U director and a twelve U director, who kind of dictate the the practice plans for those age levels. So they work with the coaches. We have group practices with like three to five teams on the ice. They'll set the practice plans, and we started using tools like yours to be able to do that. Um, I think we we still have a ways to go. Like in terms, of, I really love like what you were saying about Kitchener, you know, and having a power user where you can see who's in there, who's using it, and share plans that way. Uh, we've kind of taken a bit of an offline approach. Like we've tried to keep it as low cost as we can, right? So we're using some free tools and stuff uh, and Google Drives. But we really need to, you know, I think to take it farther, we need to have something like what you were talking about, where we can have everybody get visibility to to those plans on a single platform. But, uh, and I love what you were saying about being a smaller smaller defenseman. I got a smaller aspiring defenseman here. I got uh, a nine-year-old who's very undersized. Uh, you know, I, I like what you were saying about my ice versus using the term gap. I wrote it down. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about that next week in practice. But um, in terms of, in terms of what Wally was talking about, like, I, was, I don't know, I've said it a few times here, but we, we been trying to work with the players starting from the youngest ages, like six, seven years old, to, to really work on those four roles that Tom was talking about. Offense with the puck, offense away from the puck, defending the puck carrier, defending away from the puck. And to try and do that without, you know, starting with the cross ice stuff to try and not assign positions. Because I find once you assign a position, like if you tell a kid he, he's a D when he's six or seven, he's going to run back and try to guard the net, right? And and we ran into that a lot. So we said, all right, well, what if we send out the four guys and we just say, you know, when a face-off happens, you know, you guys figure out where you want to stand. We got three in the front, one in the back. And, you know, closest to the puck is going to be our dog. He's going to go get the puck. The next two closest guys are going to be the foxes. They got to figure out where to go. And then we've got an eagle who's above the play, right? And, and we've kind of taken that approach and translated it to five-on-five hockey now at at the 10U level. And, you know, what I've, what I've been finding is that the kids do a really great job of, of interchanging, you know, where a defenseman will join the rush, they'll jump into the offensive zone play, a four will drop back and, and cover off at the blue line kind of thing. And, you know, it's it's been, you know, I've, I've found a little bit of success with that, you know, in, in our leagues and, and with our players. And we're trying to do that, you know, we're, we're trying to make that a standard approach across the association so that all coaches are kind of coaching the same way, as opposed to saying, you're D, you know, you're going to stand on the blue line, you're going to fire it around the boards, you know, which is the standard approach that you get in youth hockey, at least around here at the town level. So, um, you know, it's, I think using tools like yours to be able to get that message across will be really helpful as we, as we go forward. Well, for sure. Well, you, you let me know, I'll, I'll help you out with that um, to get you guys on board. Um, any, any drills, obviously there's uh, it's time and effort in, in order to get these drills on board, but I could go and help you out obviously, because uh, um, obviously uh, with Benelli helping me getting on the, on this car call, at least I could do. I love I love helping out people. So you you let me know what you need. We could get you completely right on Coach Dem, and I'll, I'll uh, we could go and set up. So email me at mike at coachdem.com. We'll get you all set up with that. Um, but that that's see the, I I love I love when like a lot of people say that you can't teach thinking, and I completely opposite to that. Um, because I think the reason why I had such a long career was because of because of I started my hockey school and in when I was teaching my hockey school, my first hockey school that I had, we ended up just putting a mass email out to everybody and I had one person that signed up, one person. So we said, okay, next year, let's go and figure out what, what, what we do best. And I'm like, you know what? I think the game better than most. So let's go and teach it. So I think me going and breaking down exactly what I was doing really did help me go and say, okay, that's a strength. Let's make it even stronger. So that would be a big thing. And, and I teach, uh, so my hockey schools in July and it's, it's, it's a, a one week a hockey school, but I go over um, fundamentals. I, I reteach them how to skate on the first day. On the second day, I go over one, 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 one on one. So basically 
um, even strength, and then I go on men situations, and then offense from the back end on the fourth, and then kind of a summary day. But a lot of these things that I'm I'm teaching is being aware, being aware, and it's it's something that I, I don't want to give away all my all my tricks, but it's like even you know how to be here and there at the same time. How do you be here and there at the same time? You can't. You can't physically do it, but you're able to be prepared. And instead of going 10 feet one way and 10 feet the other way, well, why don't you go and go halfway? So we're able to be here and there at the same time. So instead of you're just going five feet here and five feet there. So there's a lot of little things that I, I have figured out with my game and I apply it to uh, the players and they, I have people coming well before this whole last two years the 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 c word i i hate saying it now um but i basically have had people coming from all over the world everywhere russia denmark finland like everywhere china so and they would stay for two weeks at a time so yeah so things have changed a little bit with that but if, if you're interested we're we're basically um pretty much wide open if you if you wanted to grab a few uh people to come and fly in uh a week in toronto you're more than welcome to too it's yeah, defensefirst.com might, might just might so. just do that i got a sister in toronto i got to visit one of these days so out of richmond there you help. go but you um go. yeah i mean I, honestly like i feel like like having coached the i've been at the youngest levels for a long time right like i've been i've been coaching starting from you know four or five year olds learn to skate learn to play through 10u for like the last seven eight years and mm -hmm. what i've really seen is like they want to think and you know we are the ones telling them not to think you know what i mean like a lot of coaches they'll say you got to get back right like you hear it all the time you walk into any rank and they're yelling at the kids get back get back when the other teams get the puck right as opposed to you know maybe it's time for the guy to guard the line or you know be aggressive and and go after and try to break up the rush and they'll try to do that right but if they get burned then it's like well, then you try to correct them so that's what i find is like we've been really playing with that is to try and if they make a mistake to not jump all over them right because maybe that mistake that they made in that situation is exactly the right decision in another situation you know what i mean so it's a it's a little bit of a i don't know it's it's a really interesting game i love coaching that age group i love the like the seven eight nine ten year olds it's 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 awesome to get in there and work with the kids that that young you know i think there's a a, a coaching tool that you probably use with your hockey schools everybody here has run hockey schools for years and uh, i wish i knew what i know now if i was going to do them again because back in the day uh, well, we used to run those uh, schools and drills with just telling them what to do. This is how you play a two-on-one. This is how you play a two-on-two. -two. And I think what Mike did, he looked at options beyond um, what coaches see. And that's what Daryl referred to is he's a player who saw the game better than most coaches. Now, Tim was a defenseman. He could speak to that. He coached Mike, and he was that smart a defenseman. And when I uh, listened to Daryl and he read his book, he said the student is the teacher. So Mike could have been a teacher for any coach he played for, if the coach asks questions, so Mike, my point yeah, well, I, I think I think the biggest thing though, I didn't realize what I was doing until I started with my hockey school because I had to learn it, and and I, it's just like Wayne Gretzky coaching in in Phoenix. He wasn't the best coach because he didn't he, he think he just did it, and I, I don't think he took the time to understand what he was doing. So, so that's one thing that was probably a big advantage of me was to, uh, and I, and I have, um, well, I used to have, uh, the pro guys come, come back every year and they would work my, they would work my camp because it would give them a refresh. And that's kind of what I did is in preparation for the year I would have in July, I would have my hockey school. 
So I'd be refreshing my mind of what I, what I have to go and teach. So it's something that I think was, um, was pretty good. It really went and uh, really helped me gather my thoughts in, in preparation for, for the, the year. Um, I, I, I just have a, just a, a few more minutes here and then I have to take off. So. Great weave, oh. uh, great, great weave. It's been, it's been a, a, a treat. And uh, I, I would, I would add this because um, I, I, again, I like Mike's um, characterization of his, his curiosity when he was a player and always asking questions. Um, and it really, truly, uh, you know, helped you be a lot better player, Mike, and a really good player. And, you know, we on here, we've talked about this before as, as a coaching group that, you know, coaches, one of the biggest jobs of coaches, there's two of them uh, in, in Wally's mind and our, our minds. Uh, maybe the number one job is to transmit belief in your players that you believe in them and that they can achieve things and be good players. That, but the second thing is that curiosity piece where the, maybe the second biggest job of a coach is to stimulate curiosity in their players. So you invite them uh, to um, explore their games by asking them questions and then, like you did, having the players ask you questions in return. But so those two things really go hand in hand and are kind of really ready. Uh, it's a, like a really simple ready guide for all coaches. Like try to be positive and transmit belief in your team and your players and, and try to stimulate curiosity so they – become better players so it's a you know it's, it's been really great to have you on mike honestly no for sure thank, thank you so much guys um i i would say though it, it's kind of almost like a therapist um you go to a therapist because and and to be honest i we we had one with um orlando solar bears it was probably the best thing ever somebody to talk to a third party wasn't your coach wasn't your assistant coach um, and it wasn't your wife or what, girlfriend or whatever. So it was a third party. It was, it was awesome. But with a therapist, what they do is they go and they listen to everything that's going on and they're able to, they're able to go and, um, um, exp with their, with their experience, they're able to go and explain why you're feeling that, um, with, with a coach that is just a coach um, and it's not as experienced as just like that therapist, that coach is not going to know how to go and explain it. Because one of the things I've always done is if a, if a player goes in and asks, am I able to pinch him that? I'm like, yeah, sure, go pinch, right? But then after he pinches and he gets beat, having to go and explain to them how to go and come up with different options because a lot of kids are like, Oh, and then the coaches get hard on them. And, but, but it's, it's something that like a therapist, the therapist knows what to say. Right. And, and that's what's going wrong with the whole entire thing. A lot of coaches don't know the, and that's what we talk about the creation series uh, with Benelli. Um, we, we go and talk about, a lot of coaches don't take the time to go and understand the little parts of a drill, even though they might steal it from somebody else, but understanding the different parts of the drill so that they might have to teach that little skill in order to go and use that drill, right? Instead of a coach going and yelling, angling, 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 you should be able to teach it and not just going get a drill and like, okay, this is going to teach you drill and let the drill teach it. It should be the coaches go and teach it and then throw in a real life experience of a drill that teaches that. So it, it, I think the, the, it's kind of broken a little bit, but um, that's why, that's why associations have to understand the, the sure they might be losing $60,000 a year, on getting a Kim, right? Getting somebody that's in charge of it. But I'm gonna say that if they built that association based on, on development and not based on making money, uh, they would be more into that. But it's, 
you know, at the end of the day, I think, I think to be honest, the Canadian, um, especially in the GTHL is a uh, model is, is broken. Uh, there is all about, um, um, too much, uh, emphasis on wins. And we all know that, but I think it's, it comes from a top down approach of, of going, getting back to development. So. Uh, Mike, the associations, um, are starting to hire full-time people like Kim. Uh, Tim, I'm not sure if you're aware, but in Calgary, the Northeast Association has hired Jesse Ale full-time. And the thing about Kim and the role she is in, she's a constant in the organization. As long as mm -hmm. she's there, she's there longer than board members, longer than parents that play volunteer roles, who influence and make decisions. She and any full-time employee, given the skill set of leadership that Kim has, can make a big difference in an organization and uh, affecting coaches, but also affecting the leadership ability of volunteer administrators that are looking after associations. So uh, you're totally right on commenting on Kim, and I, I believe that's the way the world's going to go in the minor hockey world.